sports are really important vehicles for relationships. We have purpose. We have a why. We bring people together. We connect. I feel like God is our greatest supporter and our greatest coach. Welcome to Rabbi on the Sidelines. This is Erez Sherman from Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. This week, we are joined by somebody who has more than athletic accolades. Usually, I read the achievements of them on the court, but this time, we're going to read on the court and off the court. Len Elmore from the University of Maryland, three-time All-ACC player, 1974 All-American, one of the 50 greatest players of the ACC, 10-year NBA veteran, after his career became a Harvard-trained attorney, Longtime college basketball analyst, now a professor of sports management and athlete activism at Columbia University. We are so thrilled to have Len Elmore join the show. Len, thanks for having, thanks for being with us. Sure, it's my pleasure. So, as I uh, told you just before, you were a voice of my childhood, uh, specifically with Syracuse basketball and going through the clips yesterday, hearing your voice as we made that run through the tourney. As you can see behind me, still have a remnants of that 2003 run of Melo and, and, and Coach Beheim. So let's start there because I get to talk to somebody who guided me through that journey. When you don't see the people that you're talking to like me, um, what are you trying to get across to uh, the people who are on that journey, um, both physically there, but really um, in their hearts and souls as well? Well, I mean, if, if you're speaking about my role as a color analyst, um, you know, I, I think my first purpose is really to educate through, through my experience as a player and, and through my experience in, in development in basketball and, and on television particularly, the idea is to explain what you just saw, you know, not only what, but why and how, and, and, and sometimes really project what's next. And again, based on the experience that I've had, based on what I've seen, and all of it, uh, when you put it all together, should be, a, you know, an, an enjoyable um, addition to what you already see and feel uh, with regard to the sport itself. Um, try not to get in the way, uh, but just to be kind of a, an additional support in, in how to uh, really um, understand and enjoy the game. So not necessarily like the referees when you don't want to hear their names, correct? You want actually the volume to be up to hear, because I love what you said, to explain what is happening um, from an expert. And you are an expert based on your time on the court, but not every player makes the best analyst. So how do you translate that part of your career from on the court, both in college and the NBA, to behind the microphone, explaining to both the novice and the expert something that we may not see? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, communicative skills and, and mm -hmm. to be trained in that um, you know, I, as, as an English major and you know, I took speech diction, but also, you know, recognizing how to how to reach people um, and, and communicate in, on a level that, that people can certainly understand. And that's what I strive for. I may not always succeed in doing it, but the idea is to, you know, bring myself to a level where you know, I'm not talking down to folks, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, I'm still trying to educate in an area that people many times think they know what they know, but um, maybe I can present, uh, you know, a, a different uh, version, um, a different interpretation and, and maybe force people to think. <laughs> That's hard these days to force people to think, but we need more people to think. And what you, I believe, when I, as, I, as I've watched you so, for so many years, is your humility and your humble attitude both on the air, but you really bring up this word education so much. And I was watching a clip of a different podcast you're on, I believe talking about your aunt, who is a very educated person, specifically in the geopolitical world. Um, how does education go into the sports world? Do we need more of it? Ah, student athletes, maybe define student athletes, what it was in your time as an English and broadcasting major. And now with NIL and transfer, what student athletes maybe is morphing into today? Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I mean that is a, a constant, uh, a constant battle, and even a refrain that it has to be education focused. I mean, when you're talking about college athletes, college, essentially, uh, college sports should be a vehicle um, mm -hmm. where you use, you utilize that experience, utilize that participation um, to develop oneself in, in, in many opportunities to develop certain skills, uh, but leadership is really the, the most important job of, of an institution. And I think sports kind of 
you know, narrows that focus in, in leadership development, uh, teaches so many different things. I mean, you, you develop confidence, self-esteem, um, you know, certainly uh, a level of humility, um, but uh, the perseverance and, and the uh, work ethic and the respect for others, these are all things that, that you learn as being either part of a sport, primarily a team sport, uh, but certainly in individual sports as well. And, and you take those skills and those virtues and, and you're able to apply them in, in real life. Not everybody's going to be a professional. Matter of fact, obviously, we know that the numbers, the odds are against everyone being a professional, but everyone can gain and benefit from that experience in college. And, and with the things that are going on today, I think the emphasis has shifted away from those principles and those virtues towards, you know, a, a real uh, primarily pecuniary uh, focus and, and and I think it, it's really uh, distracted young people. I mean, the fact that a star in college is making more money than now sometimes the twelfth guy on the NBA bench seems a little backwards in uh, <laughs> in my mind. Well, I mean, the, the thing about it is that, that the good aspect of it is that you know the right for one to uh, you know exploit and capitalize on their right of publicity is, is a right that should never have been abrogated by the NCAA. We're all right. entitled to that right of publicity. And so from that standpoint, I don't really have a problem. It's mm -hmm. how you how it's being used right now. And and, and unfortunately, the, the concept of pay for play, um, you know, disguised as name, image, and likeness is really what we're witnessing today. Um, and, and, you know, young people aren't lost in developing their methods on, on how to gain the most out of the system, so to speak. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, as I said, the values have shifted where it's more about the money than it is about the education and the opportunity that, you know, going to an institution of higher learning presents. It's interesting about the transfer port. I'm really fascinated about that because I remember, you know, growing up in Syracuse, watching guys come in for Coach Bayheim, having to sit out that year in plain clothes because they were dedicated to what they were about to do. Ryan Blackwell comes to mind and a lot of guys like that. But now you have somebody finishing their college career with four schools just because they're sort of working up the ladder. Um, is there a loss of loyalty either to an institution or the educational institution? Or is that also perhaps a right that, you know what, I got what I needed out of this school. Now I'm going to go to that school for what I need from there to help myself. Well, I think the environment uh, certainly has changed from, say, when I went to school or, or even when, when you went to school, uh, where, you know, coaches, uh, staff uh, pretty much remained at schools for long periods of time. And, you know, re rarely did they go to, to other programs unless they were uh, dismissed and, and wound up having to get a new job. Um, they certainly, you know, weren't poached by other institutions uh, as frequently as they are today. And so taking that in, into consideration, I think, you know, from a fairness standpoint, people feel that, okay, if uh, coaches can do that, why couldn't student athletes, you know, if they haven't found the right fit, if they haven't found an mm -hmm. institution that uh, essentially um, can, can fulfill their goals, why not be able to go to another place? The problem is not necessarily a lack of loyalty, but it's also an interference with their pursuit of an education. You know, mm -hmm. you go from one school to another, and oftentimes uh, credits don't transfer right. correctly right. and you wind up going to a school that, you know, may not necessarily fit your academic goals uh, if, in fact, you have academic goals. And again, the, the focus is more about playing time and more about, uh, you know, being able to uh, ascend to stardom in a particular program than it is about an academic fit. And, and that's sad because, again, we're still talking about college schools. Right. And so... There's the academics that happen, let's say, on the court. There's also the academics that happen, of course, off the court. But a lot of academics and life lessons happen in our own neighborhood where we grew up. And you've spoken a lot about the neighborhood where you grew up. I'm just going to play a short clip that you spoke about the integration that you had and what that meant for you growing up in terms of knowing the other as well. In the neighborhood, you're Black, you're Jewish, or you know, sprinkled in folks from Italian descent. And, you know, all we did was play baseball. I went to an elementary school that was, uh, you know, highly thought of. I was one of the few uh, black kids that was in the school. And so how did that experience, right, where right now in 2023, where we think we should know the other more than ever with social media, with so many different experiences, 
In fact, it seems like it's the exact opposite where we're separating. How did that experience growing up in Brooklyn, going to the same high school where Kareem Dul Jabbar went just a couple of years apart, um, lead you to understand that knowing the other was a really important part of the educational experience? Well, it certainly uh, was a, an exposure to, to different cultures, different ways of thought. And an interesting part about it is today, with more and more, um, I guess, integration, if you will, of, of cultures, um, we focus more on the differences than the similarities. Back right. in, in the day when I when I was growing up, we we looked at the common ground. You know, our love for sports. Um, you know, parents uh, were focused on you know, the need for our kids to be educated. And and, and quite honestly, as friends, you know, we, uh, regardless of, of what our particular cultural background was, we focused on things that uh, meant something important to all of us. And, and then today, it's just the opposite. I mean, instead of mm -hmm. common ground, we're, unfortunately, we look too much uh, to the differences that you know, that ultimately wind up dividing us or used to divide us. And then we have outside forces that uh, are injected. I mean, during those days, I grew up, the, the civil rights movement was all around us. Right. And, and I'm sure there were differences there. But um, within our communities, again, the focus was on doing the very best you can. This is post-war. Uh, people were striving to, you know, go from working class to middle class. Um, you know, there are a lot of just working class people living in public housing. As I said, it was it was highly diverse. And, and all we could think about, all our parents thought about, obviously, was working and making a living so that we would have a life better than theirs. And all we mm -hmm. thought about was trying to fulfill our parents' dreams as well as, you know, trying to find ways that, um, that we could all get along. And, and it worked. In fact, I tell people all the time, you know, watching movies and listening to television, uh, and watching television, listening to the radio, et cetera. You know, I, I never really could see color per se. You know, mm. culturally, we knew that. And as I said, the civil rights movement reminded me uh, of, of differences. But, you know, I just saw what people were and what I could be and, and focused on that and not focused on whether or not I was going to be suppressed or not allowed to do what I could do. I, I never really thought that I could be prevented uh, from achieving anything that I wanted to achieve. And so on your journey to Maryland, was the civil rights, as you just said, not seeing color, was that part of that journey? Did it affect where you look to play? Um, how, how, you're one of the best players in the ACC of all time. How did that go in conjunction with that? Or were they two separate journeys that said, I'm on this basketball journey, I'm interested in civil rights and making the society a little better? Or was there times when it wasn't such a friendly place for you. I, I recognized uh, differences. You know, as we as I got into high school, and again, the civil rights movement and, and even the, the war in Vietnam protests uh, reaching a, a, an apex. And and you know, as president of student council, I, I wanted to try to bring us all together. Again, Power Memorial at that time was a diverse school made up mm -hmm. of of young people from all different parts of the city. It was obviously a predominantly white school, Catholic, and I was not Catholic. But, um, you know, we came from different backgrounds, African-American, Irish, Italian, um, uh, and, and Latino, uh, Hispanic uh, Americans all together. And we tried to find ways, again, to get along, uh, as opposed to find, find ways where we could establish our differences. Well, we celebrated our differences. Uh, we, we certainly, you know, didn't use them as wedges. And so when I was looking at the, at the university uh, opportunities, you know, I wanted to go to a school where I still had that same diversity. That's what I grew up with, even though when we moved from the projects in Brooklyn, we were very diverse and moved to a predominantly Black neighborhood in Queens, uh, where people were strivers. Everybody uh, worked for government, whether it's the post office, the police department, the fire department, or the sanitation department. Most of the people were, were city uh, or, or federal and state workers. Uh, but but going back to, to uh, the idea of looking for university and looking for that diversity, you know, I, I was watching the ACC on television uh, because they had the game of the week there because so many New Yorkers were playing in the South, particularly in South Carolina uh, with Frank McGuire in North Carolina. Um, I, and I was recruited by Carolina, by Duke and some other places. Didn't necessarily want to visit there because at the time, you know, 
you, you heard the stories and you're frightened mm -hmm. by uh, stories of violence uh, against people of color. But nevertheless, I was uh, I was engaged by Hubie Brown, of all people, who was an assistant mm -hmm. at Duke to go down and visit. Um, and I finally went to visit Duke and recognized there are a lot of Northeasterners on campus and, you know, really a great institution. But my worry was what happens when I step off campus into mm. North Carolina in 1969? Mm -hmm. um, and, and having had an experience of living in, in a diverse um, environment, uh, what what would be the, the result of, of my seeking that diversity off campus? Um, you know, visited schools in the Northeast. Uh, I refused to go to visit UCLA. There's no way in the world I was going there because I followed him once. I wasn't going to follow him again. Uh, I'll but, let them know tonight. I'll be a poly tonight against Washington. <laughs> yeah. And well, in the end, though, it, it came down to uh, a school like Maryland, which was in the ACC. And as I said, I really admired ACC basketball, northernmost school in the ACC between mm -hmm. Two urban areas, Washington D.C. And, and Baltimore, and, and you know, uh, within proximity of, of New York City, where I can get home, uh, and, and found a, an awful lot of Northeasterners, uh, people with whom I would become accustomed to living with on campus, and ultimately made the decision to go there. And so you've said basketball got in the way of your journey, and by that you mean to Harvard Law School, and therefore when you went to Harvard Law School after a ten-year MBA. Like most people after a 10 year career say, I'm done, right? Go into broadcasting, do your thing. But why do you say, you know what? I'm going back to the classroom and not exactly any classroom, but the Harvard Law School. Um, why and what did you have to prove, I guess, to yourself or to others about doing that on your journey? Well, I mean, I had always wanted to be a lawyer. As I mentioned, growing up, I uh, watched a lot of TV and my favorite shows were Perry Mason, The Defenders, uh, other shows people may not be able to remember or relate to. And the idea was, you know, I wanted to be, you know, uh, during that period of time of civil rights struggle and others, I wanted to be kind of a voice for the voiceless and give power to the, to the mm -hmm. powerless, if you will. Um, but as I said, basketball was something that, you know, I, I ultimately became pretty good at and, and got an opportunity to play professional basketball. Um, well, a big reason why, by comparison to today, that I did pursue a, a, a career in the laws because they didn't pay us like they pay these guys today. I thought, you know, while I, I made a good living and and, and probably could have, uh, you know, maybe succeeded without uh, going through the rigor uh, of law school and, and, and practicing law. Nevertheless, it was still something that burned inside. Uh, you know, it was the internal challenge. It was uh, the refusal, uh, essentially, to you know, not achieve what I've dreamed about achieving. Um, and then also aspire to be something exemplary in some way, shape or form. You know, when I was in high school, my biggest, uh, uh, my biggest inspiration was after I read about Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. And Paul Robeson obviously was all American. He's a son of an enslaved, uh, a formerly enslaved uh, preacher. And, you know, he ultimately became Phi Beta Kappa, valedictorian at, at Rutgers, also All-American in, in football, lettered it 11 times, uh, and ultimately became a pro in baseball, football, and, and ultimately an actor and a concert singer. So as a Renaissance man, I really admired the fact that he could do all those things. And I said, why not me? Wow. Um, so that. that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, not only did I pursue a law and and then practice as a prosecutor and then private practice, but also sought some other opportunities that were presented to me, including an And one of those opportunities was becoming a basketball agent. And with my faith yarmulke on my head, uh, you spoke about the ethics that sometimes were a little, or were not up to standards in terms of how you live your life as an exemplary. Um, at what point do you realize, you know what, this might put a couple more dollars in my wallet but it's not good for my heart and soul in terms of going down the path that's uh, not spiritually healthy. Well, I mean, look, the the, the problems that I saw obviously was uh, the corruption uh, more than anything else and how as an agent, uh, in order to compete out there in, in soliciting clients and, and soliciting them for the right things. You know, I used to tell my clients that if, if I've been where you are about to go, 
Um, you know, I, I am trained to, to be able to negotiate and I certainly understand the business of sports. But, you know, I want to empower you to uh, be able to take control of your life. And by the time we're done, you won't need, you know, after a few years, you won't need, you know, my tutelage anymore. And that's kind of what uh, what I promised our guys. And, and then, you know, we had some success. But ultimately, when the money became bigger in pro sports, um, the desperation of, of other agents uh, really started to, um, you know, you know, started to increase. And so now pay young men while they're still in college to become their clients. Uh, you know, bribing other people, family members, just doing a lot of unethical things, you know, forced me to think, well, I have two choices. I could stoop to conquer and, mm -hmm. and do what they're doing, or it's time to get out of this business because I develop a good reputation. I have a license to practice law. And I didn't want to put any of that in jeopardy by, by mm -hmm. participating. So after five years, unfortunately, five years, seven first round draft picks, Wow. And most of the guys, uh, maybe all except one, most of the guys that are represented are still successful people today, uh, professionals, mm -hmm. uh, are entrepreneurs, uh, and truly learn, you know, how to navigate life. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, proud to say maybe I played some small part in it. Uh, but after five years, uh, with all of that, uh, the confluence of all of that, I just decided that I, we couldn't do it anymore. So for 30 years, you've been courtside to some pretty amazing games. And one of those unbelievable games is Duke, Kentucky with the shot. Um, you've had a seat to history, but you sometimes don't know that history is about to be made. And so let's just hear this for the audience to see. And I just want to ask, what were you thinking before, right? Is a miracle going to happen? And what are you thinking as it's playing out? 2.1 seconds left. No team has repeated as NCAA champions since UCLA did it in 1973. You know, one of the things I've seen Duke do in the past in situations like this is try for the quick pass to half court and call a quick timeout so they can get in better shooting range. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yeah! So they didn't exactly call a timeout and get into shooting range. They took the shot. Um, you said off the air, you're a color analyst, so you just sort of go for the ride. But you were there on the ride. Uh, what was that moment like before preparing the world to watch? And then the moment after when that's the thing that you see every March? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, that, you know, me guessing after seeing Duke play and then broadcasting some of their games, me guessing that they were going to call timeout. Probably should have known better since Leitner was perfect uh, in that game. They probably figured he would take the shot instead of falling time out once again. But, um, you know, I, I think that leading up to that moment, I, I, one of the things that I recognized from a historical standpoint was, you know, you have Jamal Mashburn on the floor. You have Grant Hill on the floor. And then, of course, Christian Leitner. And, and these guys uh, actually transcended their positions that mm -hmm. uh, they were able to play inside, able to play outside, um, and do a lot of things that, um, you know, heretofore traditionally, you know, kind of um, weren't the same position, if you will. They, they stretched the position to become different types of players and being a prototype of the future player. And that's one of the things that I mentioned, that in this game, we're, we're seeing that occur, that the game of basketball was changing because of the way these guys played. Now, with regard to the history of that game, uh, you know, I was fortunate to play in a game that prior to that was considered one of the greatest college games ever. Our game, Maryland versus NC State, the ACC tournament in 74. We lost in overtime 103 100, but, you know, Billy Packer, the late Billy Packer, and then others thought that that was uh, one of the greatest games ever. I, we had seven pro, uh, pro picks in, in, on the floor at one particular time. You know, it was a game that had very few, if any, you know, unforced errors and was played at, at a very high level. And this game, though, with the suddenness of, of the ending, I mm -hmm. think uh, kind of surpassed it for a lot of people. But, you know, historically, I didn't really think that it would make a, a great deal of history, at least not reach the legendary proportion that it did today uh, until, you know, I'm back on the train going home and saying, you know what? No, that was something else. And by the way, that was uh, 
on my 40th birthday. Oh, nice. Happy birthday. Um, you mentioned you mentioned Billy Packer, the late Billy Packer just passed away this week. It's a timely conversation. Um, I saw one of your tweets really saying that he was an influence of you going into broadcasting. What did he mean to the broadcasting world? And uh, what are we going to miss about Billy Packer? Well, Billy, I mean, he had, he's he been out of announcing for a while, but he, he mm -hmm. certainly set the tone for being one, a straight shooter, uh, you know, didn't mince words. Uh, but, you know, he, he de developed a, a, a passion for the game that was infectious. Um, you know, I, the reason I say he had an influence on my career is because it's specific. Uh, when Raycom, you know, who did the ACC games, mm -hmm. uh, which Billy was like the lead analyst, was looking to essentially integrate their announcing team to find a, a black analyst. It was Billy who brought my name up. And I know that because the executive producer, who's still a friend of mine, uh, mentioned that to me uh, that you know Billy immediately said you know why don't you call Red Elmore and I was in my second year of law school at the time I'd mm -hmm. never really had any broadcast experience uh, but it was Billy who brought my name up and we always had a good relationship when we did our games at, at the University of Maryland so um, you know that that gave me a, a, an inkling as to you know he thought pretty highly of me and you know I always watched him and and tried to emulate his style. Uh, again, not talking down to people, trying to educate, uh, projecting what could happen, but uh, telling the viewer why and how. And, and, and the thing I liked about Billy was he wasn't loquacious. He he said what he needed to say, and that was it. And, and I think that's what uh, that's what viewers are entitled to. It's a good rabbinic lesson for young rabbis coming out of school in the pulpit as well. As my senior rabbi says, if you can't say it in 250 words or less, you're probably not worth saying at all. <laughs> makes sense. Conciseness makes all the difference in the world. And so let's get to this idea of activism, because there weren't really classes in athletes and activism until it seems like fairly recently. Growing up again in the Syracuse basketball world, I saw their acts of kindness that they did, whether it's the special needs community, the homeless, the inner city. They were out in the schools, but not necessarily taught structurally what athletes and activism means. You mentioned often the Colin Kaepernick uh, sort of moment in terms of athletes really using their platform and their teams and their leagues to make changes within this uh, society. So maybe you can define what athletes and activism means to you and what you're teaching to sports management people going into the field today. Well, when we talk about activism, I'm, I'm really talking about activism within kind of the constraints of, of developing social justice or promoting and being an advocate for social justice as opposed to community service, which, you know, has to be uh, differentiated. Community mm, service is providing service for a particular goal at the mm -hmm. time, but not the broader sense of, of, of justice, which includes equity, inclusion, and, and certainly, um, you know, from a criminal justice standpoint, reform. And, and I think athletes uh, have a unique platform in America because right. uh, sports is, is tightly woven in, in our social fabric. And, and what athletes can do is bring awareness um, to you know the ills uh, of society from a from a social standpoint that uh, that they certainly can not only educate themselves and, and to be advocates for, but also in many ways the thing that characterizes athlete activism is their willingness to sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we've seen that in, in our uh, in our history. Remember, uh, against the social, economic, and political backdrop of America, athlete activism is not a new thing. I mean, it occurred since sports became a thing in the post-Civil War America. And, and we've seen it in two different ways, passively through accomplishment and overcoming and, and you know, essentially establishing an example. I, I look at guys like Joe Lewis and maybe even Jesse Owens to a certain extent who didn't speak out, but were passive in, 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 in doing so because of the things they, they accomplished and some of the things they did behind the scenes. And then actively, you have people who definitely spoke out and demonstrated. I mentioned Paul Rosen, who was a human rights activist after his career. You know, you look at people like Billie Jean King, um, you know, Jackie Robinson, of course, right. uh, was uh, one of the original outspoken activists, both through his example and through his words. And then followed by Ali and uh, Smith and, and, and Carlos. And today we have the Williams sisters. We got Maya Moore, who... Is, is a tremendous example. And that for mental health, uh, Naomi Osaka, uh, you know, so we have different people for 
different reasons um, that are activists for different causes. But nevertheless, many of them have made sacrifices in order to to get the message across. Yeah, Maya Moore's story is amazing. I saw that on Outside the Line. So she's gave up her basketball career, meets this exactly. young man in prison, but then is doing great work. And it's interesting about the gender piece as well. I just saw Brianna Stewart signing with the New York Liberty, but really focusing on charter travel, why the men have it and why the women don't. Or in the NCA two years ago, why they got this weight room that was the size of a podcast studio and the men get every gym they want. Um, is there a moment where these athletes have to decide, you talked about sacrifice, will this sacrifice, if you wish, ruin my athletic career because I will be canceled in today's world? And how do they decide or how do you think, what is the moment of decision that say, I'm going to go forward and I can do both or I'm going to have to choose one and either speak up or not? I don't think you can move forward and say, I can do both. Uh, you can move forward mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to do what's right. And then a uh, circumstance and, and, and even society will, will determine whether you can do both. I mean, you look at oh. Colin Kaepernick. You know, Colin Kaepernick didn't decide whether he can do both or not. He stood on principle and ultimately you know his livelihood was taken away from him although you know and obviously from a karma standpoint he ultimately gets rewarded uh through his corporate um association with nike who supported him um mm -hmm. and, you know you have others who uh may have been able to do both uh megan rapino is somebody who's you know not only stood firmly uh for for a certain principle and still has been rewarded with winning and you know helping uh women particularly in the um, women's national soccer team get uh, equal pay uh you know, things of that nature it really depends on the circumstance but but the idea is that's the crossroads you don't know and what's more important standing right. up for what's right and being an advocate or trying to hold on to what you have and still be an advocate oftentimes when people do that it becomes performative social justice activism right. as opposed to true social justice activism um you know tommy smith and john carlos didn't think about you know what their uh you know what the consequences would be uh from them doing their demonstration in 68. muhammad ali absolutely knew that he was going to he thought he could be prosecuted and put in jail uh, mm -hmm. when he established and, and, and confirmed his conscientious objector status against the war in Vietnam and for five years he sacrificed lost the best years of his life and the money that he could have made as a world champion but you know stood for principle and ultimately was rewarded by history so um yeah once you get to to that point you have to decide that um social justice and and your activism is more important than trying to hold on to your livelihood your circumstances but you'll go down in history as an activist who did the right thing. Exactly That's interesting really because cool. sometimes activism comes from mistakes. And one of those people that I just had on the show yesterday, um, now a friend of Sinai Temple, is Myers Leonard, former NBA player trying to get back into the NBA, who very quickly admitted his mistake and reached out to the community that he hurt. He was right here yesterday at Sinai Temple. He went into our third and fourth graders um, as they as he watched them learn their 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 prayers. And he said to me, I don't think you understand, Rabbi, but they are healing me. And so activism coming from the mistakes that we make, what have you seen in that? And how has that led to maybe blessings out of mistakes? Well, I mean, I haven't seen an example like Myers Leonard, um, uh, but, but out of mistakes, you know, people look for forgiveness mm -hmm. and, and seeking forgiveness. Um, that unto itself is a teaching lesson for those uh who ultimately you know may either you know make the same mistake uh, or prone to making the same same mistake and you know it's a teaching lesson and i think that's uh the the thing that is more revealing than anything else and people to learn from the mistakes of others and in that regard you know the mistakes that you made especially if you're um if you're seeking forgiveness you know, will not have been made in vain. I mean, that, right. that is how we learn. Absolutely. And so this is what you said. Uh, I heard you say before that, you know, you've reached an age where you have still have something to give. Again, you, you don't 
have to do what you're doing, but you're doing it because you still have something to give. This is what you said about athletes and activism, what you're doing at Columbia University. Uh, as a young man, I recognize the importance of, of staying true to your discipline, to you know, be an activist for social justice, to stand for what was right. Uh, after I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and, and saw his transformational change and, um, you know, as a young black man during that time, that was kind of a, a rite of passage to read that book and understand who you are and the role that you play. So, uh, so often students today, they're young, they're in graduate school, and they don't even know the names that we're talking about. And I'm a little older than the Gen Z population. Um, how do you introduce them to those historical figures when the historical figures, I say that in quotes, are Instagram celebrities today who are using their platform in a sometimes deep way, but often maybe a little more shallow, but getting a lot more reach than the people that you just mentioned? Well, I mean, thank, good, thank goodness for things like YouTube and, and other, uh, air, uh, other medium that media that has captured, uh, you know, folks uh, historically. And you know, I try to use the same uh, same methods we take uh, uh, through recordings to, you know, kind of give people an idea of exactly who it is we're talking about, and to the, allow them to make the comparisons. You know, I you talk about you know learning from them. I talk about learning from mistakes of others, and, and the autobiography, autobiography of Malcolm X is exactly uh, what that tells you about the mistakes of others. He learned, uh, you know, through his bouts with uh, the criminal justice system. I think that gave him an opportunity to, to reinvent himself. And, and, and people can recognize that there are methods of forgiveness out there in, in making mistakes and others can look at the mistakes made by others and, and avoid them. And, and that's what we try to teach. And, and so today, um, as I said, comparison of those uh, figures, uh, historical figures uh, of the past that have kind of set the tone for you know, activists today, um, you know, we try to bring them alive and, and then have people compare, you know, the origins as well as what we're saying today and, and then make some decisions and make some value judgments. So if you're a professor today and we're in your class right now, what are the three top books that we need to read to get into the world of athletes and activism? Well, you know, I, I don't have a, a textbook per se uh, on, on activism. I, I talk about understanding individuals um, and understanding history. As I said, let's take a look from the beginning uh, of sport when it became a thing in America in post-Civil War mm -hmm. until today. You know, take a look at not only who the athletes were and what sport was about, but what was going on in the nation. Um, right. You know, there was a period of time uh, where virulent racism uh, occurred, where, you know, athletes uh, in, in the beginning of sport, uh, whether it was horse racing, whether it was uh, cycling uh, or even baseball, you know, suddenly athletes of color, black athletes particularly, were uh, legislated out simply because, again, Plessy versus Ferguson allowed them to be legislated out. And then you look at uh, history where Necessity was a mother of invention, the invention of the Negro League and others, which ultimately spawned, you know, great players who were the um, the initial black players in, in the major leagues in, in the 40s. Um, you know, why did that happen? And then uh, again, uh, the economic backdrop during uh, scarce economic times when we went through recessions and even the depression, uh, people hit the hardest were, were people of color. Uh, and so uh, again, athletes were you know the examples of whether it was Jesse Owens as I mentioned or Joe Lewis, um, you know they were they were examples for people to continue to strive even though they were you know hit the hearts and then we have other people that people don't even know about uh, per se John McClendon who was a great uh, basketball coach who taught lessons in, in teaching in the South uh, that uh, were, were invaluable for people to hold on to young people to hold on to it as they do. And they develop, and, and that's just one example uh, of so many others. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's history, not necessarily any textbook per se, nice. but it's history that, that that we need to be able to chronicle and put in perspective based upon all those things, as I mentioned, social, political, and economics in America, 
uh, to ultimately find out the role that athletes could play, not only in you know advancing uh, civil rights and advancing human rights, but also in advancing American ideals. Uh, mm-hmm. and again, Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis are perfect examples of a cynical America who you know would segregate them and, and, and suppress them in America, but use them internationally uh, against um, you know Hitler and Aryan nations to use them as an example. Uh, of you know American uh, American dominance and, and you know democracy when they would beat uh, athletes from right. from Germany and and use that as as a propaganda tool you know that that kind of cynicism is something that uh, we look at and, and, and recognize uh, the propaganda opportunities that, that were made uh, from the on the backs of uh, of these black athletes who didn't have rights when they were at home but certainly were used as uh, you know, as American ideals uh, across the pond, so to speak. That uh, idea is actually brought up in the movie Glickman, about Marty Glickman, the great broadcaster. Yes. And uh, it's fascinating when they said, okay, they have rights over there, but when they come home, it's like they're nothing. Um, and then and, I know... And, and, yeah, I was going to say, that I was sad, too, that, that Marty Glickman wasn't able to run uh, in, in, in Germany. Because he, was, he was a great athlete unto himself. And I know one of the things you're working on within the activism world is um, getting not just athletes, but coaches and other people within the athletic management, specifically in the minority field, the right opportunities as well. What are the keys to that? I know the Miami Dolphins uh, thing was definitely on your mind and you worked uh, um, hard on that. Um, A good friend of this show, Dave Sims, also talks about how in the baseball world, um, he's one of the only um, African-American announcers on TV. what are the keys to making that next step? As you just told your story, right? That Billy Packer said, talk to this guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, is it just that, or is it a different systemic thing that can lead to greater success? I think it's a combination of everything. It's about preparation that, um, you know, those who aspire, those of color who aspire to those positions certainly have to be prepared. And, and many of them are. Then it's a question of the decision makers have to become familiar with mm-hmm. that. I mean, that, you know, I'm not going to uh, attribute total racism uh, to the lack of, of opportunity for for black coaches and you know black announcers and others. I, I think some of it also is based upon you know cultural segregation and that uh, people just don't know. People hire who they know, right? And I think it's really important for you know, more outreach, uh, voluntary outreach uh, to from the decision makers to those uh, from the underrepresented uh, groups to understand who they are, to get to know who, who these people are. So, you know, they're on the tip of their tongues as much as, um, you know, their white counterparts. And I think that that's extremely important. There have been programs that certainly have started to address that. I think it just needs to be you know, more uh, more prioritized and, and ultimately, you know, a point needs to be made that, um, you know, if in fact you get to know people, you're going to find that uh, people have the same, if not greater qualifications, particularly to run a team. Interesting point about it, college football, we talk about the dearth of, of black college head coaches. And, you know, we've asked, uh, in, as co-chair of the Knight Commission, we've asked the college football playoff that mm-hmm. controls the, the monies uh, with regard to college football to donate one penny of their um, of their revenue source to programs such as the one I just identified. And for some reason, they just refuse to do it, which, you know, that is something that I, I really can't explain. And these are people who are educated and understand the issue exists, but will not get involved. And, you know, that that's a constant uh, battle that, that we've had with regard to you know, trying to create more equity in college sports. Well, it's interesting you say where it starts because you said people know who we people people hire who we who they know, and then I go back to your story of the neighborhood that you grew up and who did you know in that neighborhood? People not like you and people not like me. And I'm, I'm very grateful within the Syracuse community that I grew up on the basketball court, on the baseball field, of people who were like me and not like me. And therefore, I can spend my rabbinic time talking to people like you, uh, not just about sports, but how sports is this vehicle to know the other so that knowing the other can lead to better change as well. Um, so it all it all it all definitely fits together. Um, two last questions, one ordinary, the other sacred. And I guess we'll uh, start with the sacred. Um, 
faith and sports. Um, do you see a role of faith in the sports world, either passively or actively? Um, I know we see it sometimes more outwardly, specifically with Demar Hamlin went right. No, no prayer in the football field. Everybody pray in the football field. Right, right. Um, but is there is there a a role for and I use the term faith loosely um, in the world of sports that also can move on the aspects of social justice that you're speaking about? Well, I mean, again, beyond the articulation, when you listen to athletes being interviewed, everybody wants to give God the glory. And then, you know, I'm not disputing that. Uh, but but I think it, it's got to be greater than that. And, and there's also has to be recognized beyond that articulation because some people just aren't willing to do that. They keep it private. But faith in in, in God, in a higher power, in a power that's generally greater than, than a power that's greater than ourselves. Uh, you know, I, I think it gives you purpose as an athlete. Uh, it alleviates, quite honestly, it alleviates pressure too, because you're able to say, you know, I, I'm moved to work as hard as I possibly can to fulfill, you know, my, my, my to fulfill my potential. Uh, and, you know, whatever happens is God's will, not mine. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's important to understand. And, and I think also, it helps believe in, in, in an ordered society where humility is, is the face of, of of humanity, so to speak, and in, in, in light of a greater power. And, and that you know, I, I think that's uh, beyond mere humanity is the the love and respect and, and ideals that, uh, that that we should hold and prioritize. You know, and, and with that, you understand the game, you understand people, you understand teamwork and collaboration, um, you know, those ultimately become the most important thing. It, it always hit me, it was related to basketball, something that Dean Smith talked about. He talked about five players, one heartbeat. Mm, and and nice. I think that belief uh, in others as well as reflection of, of a belief in, in a higher power and, and why we're here, uh, you know, what that purpose is. So um, I'm not sure if that, uh, if that explains, you know, my idea of, you know, the, the idea of faith in, in sports, uh, if that, you know, fully answers your question. But, yeah. you know, it's something that, that, that I've felt for a long time. But it's, it's about purpose. Mm -hmm. and it's about understanding the order in life. And, you know, we are, you know, individually, you may have to have that humility. I mean, five players, one heartbeat reminds me of standing in a sanctuary of either a synagogue or a church or a mosque and singing together. And when you have that moment of singing together, you right. realize that actually we are one um, with many, many different voices coming together, singing that same song as well. And on the ordinary, um, with your expertise in the college basketball sports world, you can't keep track with who's number one these days because it's just falling left and right. Um, it's February now and we're heading to March. So uh, we're predictions here. It's a faith show, but <laughs> we're not going to make you a prophet. But uh what do you see coming up in the next uh, eight weeks? Um, you know, I, I see a couple more number ones. I mean, right now, say Purdue is, is the number one team in the nation, but I don't know if there's the best team because there is no dominance. Uh, you know, I think when the tournament starts, the, the team that is healthiest uh, probably exhibits the most athleticism and, uh, you know, can use defense to kind of weather the storm when the offense isn't working is the team that's ultimately going to win those six games. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Kansas has a big shot of doing that. Um, I also like Houston, the way that, that they're playing. They're, they're the kind of team that's built upon that. They don't have – they have guys who can step up above and beyond um, the, the call at, at a given time, but they do have that athleticism and that consistency on defense that – you know, can get the job done. I know a week ago, everybody said Alabama was the know, best right. team in the country, and then they get slammed uh, in the, the Big 12. I think it was by Oklahoma in the Big 12 SEC. So, you know, everybody's going to have their ups and downs. But in the end, I think that the, uh, the the character of the team that plays consistent defense, that's got athleticism um, up and down and, and remains healthy is, is the team that's going to win. So, um I hope that answers your question because I don't really have a team. There's no great team out there that you can say is dominant.
That was a very rabbinic answer, just asking more questions to a great question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's good. That's the college basketball world today. Len, we are so thankful for you joining us here in Rabbi on the Sidelines. Len Elmore, University of Maryland, three-time All-CAC player, 1974 All-American, Harvard University trained lawyer, 10-year MBA veteran, now teaching at Columbia University School of Sport Management of Athletes and Activism. But as you heard today, really a moral voice and conscience of the sports world in this great country of the United States of America. Len, thank you so much for uh, joining us, and we hope to see you here in Los Angeles shortly. Have a great yes, day. It's been my honor. Thank you. Thank you.